Welcome. My name is Christina Laraca Cerrone. My name is Matt Morat. And we are delighted to welcome you this morning to Gartner Marketing Symposium Expo. This year's theme is Lead Marketing Through Disruption's Next Wave. Today, we'll be exploring how marketing has adapted to disruption so far and what will be required for you to navigate further disruptions ahead. I've had the privilege of speaking at Gartner conferences and with marketing leaders like all of you for the past 10 years. 10 years ago, I was up on a stage very similar to this one in Miami, Florida, talking about direct mail. <laughs> it's safe to say some things have changed. That said, some things always seem to stay the same. The marketing best practices may have evolved, but topics like improving marketing and sales alignment, optimizing a digital strategy, and improving customer experiences are evergreen. What's interesting to me is that if you look at these or pretty much any topic, you can see in the subtext three fundamental challenges that we as marketers always seem to face. Three challenges that I bet all of you could relate to years ago and can still relate to today. Those are being tasked with achieving seriously ambitious growth goals, having to deal with continual scrutiny of our efforts and our plans by our peers, and constantly needing to adapt to wave after wave of external disruptions. So, especially on that last challenge, it seems like we're in agreement. The only constant is change. And still, to the credit of everyone here, you've been resilient through those disruptions, like a house weathering a storm. Mm, indeed. Uh, typically, marketing has adapted its house to disruption by making changes to the building blocks of the marketing function, our people, processes, and technologies. And by adapting, marketing has been able to continue to deliver campaigns, insights, and growth. Let's get started by taking a two-minute look back at how marketing has adapted to three past waves of disruption we've already faced. Take the rise of the internet. With it, we launched new web pages and delivered digital campaigns to our customers, which meant adapting with new digital marketing strategist roles, tech stack additions like digital asset management or content platforms, and new content production processes to align digital experiences with the customer journey. Or a second example, social media changed the way society operates and gave us all a friend in Tom from MySpace. But it also opened up a new world of two-way interactions between brands and their customers. And so we hired social media marketers, we bought social listening tech, and we figured out how to split our campaigns into bite-sized pieces. Did, did anyone else just feel compelled to make sure their MySpace is truly deleted? <laughs> just, just me? <laughs> OK, uh, one last example. When digital and social moved firmly into mobile platforms, we shifted from my old favorite, direct mail, uh, or even email, to delivering messages and devices in everybody's pockets. And so we introduced more new roles, mobile marketing managers or app developers, processes and technologies like push marketing or automation platforms to help us support complex multi-channel journeys. Again across past waves of disruption, we adapted by introducing new rules, new technologies, new processes that let us keep doing the things we've been doing in new places and channels. In other words, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Marketing's achieved some great things by adapting to deliver, and that's really testament to all of you. Since adaptations cost us significant effort and money, every time disruption hits, and yet, you've made it through. Being at a conference is always a good time to reflect. And if you look back across the last decade, I bet you've got a lot to be proud of, especially if you think about the work that you've had to put in every time you've adapted and evolved your function. The problem is, we believe the waves are about to change. And it begs the question, how will we cope if the scale and frequency of disruptions increase? What if those disruptions come internally as well as externally? And what happens if we're not just dealing with one disruption, but multiple waves of disruption at the same time? Nobody knows for sure exactly what shape the next disruption to our marketing house will take, although we can collectively make some smart guesses. And you'll see a lot of those predictions in sessions the next few days. What we do know is that the next wave is like nothing we've faced before. 
History suggests that change is exponential rather than linear, and that once the foundations of change are established, future paradigm shifts happen faster and get bigger. So for instance, it took thousands of years to get to stone tools, but only about 15 years to conceive of and build the printing press. Right now, all the foundations have been set for another paradigm shift. Globalization, nanotechnology, the first tottering steps of AI in the real world. These create the conditions for waves of change that not only accelerate, but converge, creating what we're calling waves of convergent disruption. Convergent disruption means that changes build upon and intersect with one another, creating new, bigger dynamics and complexities. For example, new realities of data privacy can in turn drive complexity in buying journeys as targeting becomes harder and harder. Shifts in consumer sentiment can impact brand loyalty, which might drive even more internal scrutiny on marketing impact. Or as shifts in consumer sentiment manifest in employees, those sentiment changes may exacerbate existing talent shortages as employees look for employers aligned to their values. All of these ch things change how marketing and marketers work. Any of them could be manageable on their own, but today we can't adapt fast enough to all of them. Convergent disruption creates interdependencies that make these changes impossibly complex. We can't tease them apart, and we can't adapt people, process, and technology fast enough to respond to everything all at once. We can't just keep adapting because it just won't work. The marketing function of today is one that adapts to deliver. The marketing function of tomorrow is one designed to direct disruption. In this session, we're going to show you how to become just that. But first, let's consider how different the marketing function of tomorrow really has to look by examining the marketing function of today and that adapt to deliver model. If we think about the typical marketing function, we have our people at the center. We have our technologies giving us our foundations, our internal and external partners added in where we need extra support, and our processes creating a framework for everything that we do. So people, process, technology, and internal and external partners the building blocks of the marketing function. Indeed. It's hardly revolutionary, but it is what it is. And look, in marketing, we're always talking about the three pillars of this or the foundations of that, so let's run with it. Let's build this all up into that classic marketing analogy, a house. More specifically, <laughs> more specifically the adapt to deliver marketing house. Now, we continually retrofit this house to meet changing needs or to respond to disruption. So the change is driven by the internet when we added to the existing structure of the house. That's like adding an extension to the house. Change is driven by social media when we connected the inside to the outdoors. That's like adding patio doors. Mobile marketing involved some pretty drastic changes to the systems that we use, so that's like a kitchen renovation where you've moved around some pipes and pathways. All of these changes are retrofits in which the fundamental building blocks of the marketing house remain the same, even if they move around a little. Each change costs us time and effort and money, but at the end of the day, we're still living in the same house. This is what we're calling the adapt to deliver model. Talking of the limits of adaptations, my house in Toronto is about 120 years old. Uh, and what I've learned the hard way is that there are only so many changes you can really make to a house like that. You might knock down some walls or squeeze in a main floor bathroom, which is the dream of all Torontonians. I can see there are some Canadians in the room. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, though, no matter how many renovations you make, your floor plan is still basically going to be the same. Renovations, even big ones, only take you so far. At some point, as your family grows and changes, you eventually need to start fresh. Similarly, a marketing house that has adapted to deliver is not prepared for the next wave of disruption. We have reached the retrofitting limit. Let's get real for a minute. Just consider this. If you're really honest with yourself, after all of those adaptations, all of those often significant changes to team structures, processes, or MarTech stacks, has the perception of marketing changed? Have you won more respect, more authority, more strategic influence? Nearly half 
of CMOs tell us that marketing is seen as a cost center rather than a profit driver in their organizations. Marketing budgets have dropped 15% year over year from 2023 to 2024. And this follows four straight years of budget privation. If that made your ears prick up, uh, make sure that you join our key insights from 2024 Gartner CMO Spend Survey session. In the past, we've succeeded at dealing with external threats. But today, the call is coming from inside the house. And it's not just a call about budget cuts. AI has the potential to collapse the building blocks we've all been using for marketing, our people, our processes, and our technology. In fact, we can already see it happening. Gartner has found that this year, marketing departments will spend 7% of their budgets on generative AI, while 26% of CMOs expect to reduce headcount as a result of AI investments. Now, that's a huge shift already in motion, and it's being driven by incredibly high expectations. CEOs expect to see a 17% productivity gain in their companies by 2025. CMOs, ever the optimists, expect to see productivity increasing by 27% in the next 18 months. And for context, across the last 80 years, productivity growth has been around 2% per year. I mean, just take a moment to let that set in, in terms of what's expected of you. That's wild, right? The potential gains are seductive, but we can't escape the truth. These kinds of changes are big, and they're fast, and they're not only tech investments. They impact the whole house. Put plainly, with a convergent wave of disruption on the horizon, the approach we've always used is not going to be enough. Again, the marketing house of today adapts to deliver. The marketing house of tomorrow will need to be designed to direct disruption. In other words, it's time to stop retrofitting. It's time to build something new. And look. We're not saying that you need a chrome-plated space pod like the one on screen. You can take that as an inspirational concept. The truth is, there's no one design that will be perfect for everyone. But we can tell you the three essential design aspects you'll have to have in a marketing function designed to direct disruption. Firstly, given the storms that we face, our houses need to be designed to coexist with the elements. In marketing, that means designing our teams to work well alongside AI. Second, your home should fit into its neighborhood. Marketing's already involved in more cross-functional work than any other department, and as that increases, we'll need to be more selective about collaboration. And then finally, even though the design of our house might seem very different, we're still going to need crucial things to make it livable, like doors, windows, floors, maybe even the main floor bathroom. If you want. Similarly, marketing will only be successful if CMOs and their teams keep hold of what's crucial for us, our essential value drivers. Each of these design elements allows you to direct disruption and harness its energy to power your business. We're going to examine these elements one by one, and we'll share the absolutely essential things you must do to get started. We'll also highlight specific sessions on the agenda that support these big three themes. And listen, I get it. These are big changes. But we have some good news. No matter how lofty and ambitious this change feels right now, no matter how unfamiliar or how risky, by the time you leave this room today, you'll have the shape of a new path in your head. By the time you leave the conference, you'll have clear action plans and really ex exciting, inspiring ideas to take back to your team to launch you into the next decade of marketing growth and innovation. The first element of a marketing function designed to dis direct disruption is building to coexist with AI. We've already touched on the scale of the disruptive effects of AI, so let's prepare for that and design a marketing function that doesn't just mitigate the impacts of AI, but actually helps us to harness them. That's one part of what it means to direct disruption. For a lot of us here today, the promise of AI doesn't yet match the reality, and there are fair reasons for that. I mean, a lot of AI projects are just plain hard. Before we ever see results, there are legal implications to work through, and CX implications, and data and tech integrations to untangle, not to mention the big long list of other urgent things we need to deal with first. If this is you, fear not. At this symposium, we have sessions to help you tackle some of these challenges, but for now, 
we want to focus on the look and the feel of a marketing house that embraces AI so that we can avoid wasted effort and build with intent. Gartner spent the past year studying business AI transformation. And while the transformation journey looks different for everyone, we can discern some truths about the process of transforming to an AI-enabled future that you can use to guide your own path forward. Here's what we've learned. Embedding AI deeply into our activities is going to create tech and talent interdependencies that even advanced marketing functions aren't ready for. Now, that might feel like we're saying you need to make big, sweeping changes. But actually, you only need to make one specific pivot in your thinking. And that is this. When it comes to generative AI or the combination of AI technologies, you need to stop thinking about AI as just another tool to add to your tech stack and start thinking about AI as an actor on your team. But the move from tool to actor is more than just attaining a higher level of technological maturity at your organization. Let me show you what we mean. Tools help you to save time and money by performing specific tasks within a specific workflow process. So a basic use case for AI as a tool would be to generate images for you for something like a brochure or a campaign based on your specific prompts. Think AI, show me three pictures of bears in the style of Jackson Pollock. They're cute, huh? Over time, AI becomes a smart tool where you set parameters, a promotional campaign on social, targeting Gen Z, and the AI system recommends images or headlines most likely to resonate with your audience. Think the AI tool suggesting this size of Jackson Pollock bear in these colors has performed well with Gen Z in the past. But as we shift to AI as an actor, AI starts to suggest campaign ideas. So imagine a platform telling you, Gen Z prefers bears in the style of Salvador Dali. They also like short videos. So instead of what you said, I think we'd be better off targeting them with a YouTube ad featuring a Dali bear. Also, I'll do that for you. And don't worry too much about the cost, since I reckon I can figure out when it makes the most sense to stop. Just trust me. Mm. Scary, huh? But it's also fascinating. Between AI as a tool giving us bears on request and AI as an actor running our ads, you might have spotted three differentiating factors. The first is autonomy. AI as an actor doesn't just provide a response when called upon. It has the latitude to react, offer, and even correct ideas. Secondly, AI as an actor is embedded into the process. In other words, it's always on. And then thirdly, even with a human overseeing things, that work is trusted by its human colleagues. AI as a tool is used. It's an add-on to your processes, and its outputs are painstakingly verified. AI as an actor is autonomous, embedded, and trusted, just like an employee is on your teams. Yes, you'll need to oversee their efforts, but you shouldn't micromanage them because it'll limit their achievements. Now, this is a future vision, not the reality today, but at the current rate of progress, AI will be a f an actor in our marketing functions sooner than a lot of us think. And that's a proposition that might seem overwhelming for those of you who feel like you're behind in AI experimentation already. So how do you navigate this forward-looking transformation, regardless of where you are in your journey? Here's one way to start. A good workflow map will allow you to identify where and how AI is making decisions, and where human oversight may still be needed, or where you can begin to grant autonomy. So just as an example, take something like creating an RFP for agency selection. Sourcing requirements might be owned by your marketing and business team, but an AI tool might review those RFPs. AI as an actor might make recommendations about which agency to select. In these maps, you might use AI as a tool in some places, but call on it as an autonomous actor in others. Maybe right now you're only using it as a tool, but being able to map where it's being used today gives you clarity around its impact and helps you plan for where you want more AI usage or autonomy tomorrow. This map allows you to act with intention. You are defining where AI has latitude and where it requires oversight. It also helps you plan for the second arena of tech and talent interdependencies, namely how AI impacts talent on our human team. Because here's something else we're learning. 
the evolution of AI from tool to actor may not be something you can choose or not choose. It may, in fact, be decided by AI itself as it becomes more and more involved in your organization. In short, the future is here, and it's gaining sentience. If that feels dystopian, wait, there's more. If you haven't planned for the intersections of tech and talent, you may also see higher levels of skill degradation. Just think, other than when you checked into this hotel, when is the last time that you were asked to find your way somewhere using a paper map? When is the last time you even held a paper map instead of using GPS? As we've turned more and more to apps, we've increasingly lost our ability to find our way without a GPS to help us. That is skill degradation. In the same way as we've offloaded wayfinding to GPS, we need to consider the impact on talent of offloading marketing, or indeed, human skills to AI. In particular, there are four types of reasoning skills it will become essential to protect and build amongst your teams. Ethical reasoning, strategic reasoning, scientific reasoning, and systems thinking. You might already have some form of training set up on these skills, but it's not simply about practicing them once a year during an offsite. The switch required is to make this kind of thinking a constant topic of discussion or a consideration around how work gets done every single day. That means making a point of asking your team more questions like, how are the problems we're solving potentially interrelated? Or what was our initial hypothesis? Or even something as simple as, so what have we definitively learned from the project? One last thought on avoiding skill degradation. If AI means that every marketing function has a similar set of tools, those reasoning skills become a key differentiator. But just like it takes time to build a muscle, it takes time to build reasoning skills. So at the, sound, at the risk of sounding like a personal trainer, now is the time to start exercising. And remember, focus on the tech and talent interdependencies so that you can build with intention. For now, that's enough about AI-powered teams, though I hope it's left you wanting more. If it has, these sessions on the agenda are for you. The emergence of AI shows us how convergent disruption changes the fundamental design of your marketing house. As AI-driven collapses in people, process, and technology, transform how marketing works. But if we harness those disruptive conditions, we can make our house more efficient, more sophisticated, and, let's face it, cooler. And yet, just like you can't put up a brutalist palace in a sleepy little town without causing issues for your neighbors, you can't just think about your own function in isolation. That's right. In today's business world, the fences between you and your neighbor are coming down. And your neighbors are undergoing construction as well, as other functions in your organization evolve themselves. All this evolution means achieving tomorrow's goals amidst a wave of convergent disruption is going to bring a lot more cross-functional stuff. Marketing might be heavily involved in projects like AI transformation or driving profitable growth or customer journey orchestration, but you won't be doing it alone. And this is where we need to make another shift in order to direct disruption. The natural tendency of the adapt to deliver marketing function is to collaborate more and more. And we know it can be difficult to say no. But in your new designed to direct disruption posture, you'll need to be more selective. Exactly. The next time you're being thrown another cross-functional project to work on, consider this. Marketers spend 17% more time cross-functionally collaborating than non-marketers. Today, CMOs spend nearly half their time working on cross-functional initiatives. That's an exhausting amount. I'm genuinely impressed that you found the time to make it here today unless this is another cross-functional collaboration effort, in which case, good luck. <laughs> you might think that you're doing this to save your team's time, but in fact, they're spending just as much time collaborating as you are. And here's the real kicker. Despite us spending all of that time and effort on high-impact projects, our impact still isn't really appreciated. In fact, and please remember I'm just the messenger here, 55%, 55% of your business collaborators, in other words, your peers across different functions, they say that marketing's an inhibitor to the success of their projects. So they're not collaborating as much as you, 
And they're saying that when you do collaborate with them, you're actually hindering them. And it doesn't leave you wanting to collaborate more, does it? But it does show us that something needs to change. We're hearing that need to change loud and clear from the CMOs that we speak to and the struggles that they've shared. Consider this. How often have you caught yourself pushing for marketing inclusion in a project because it's important for marketing visibility, but later struggled to articulate your value contribution? How often have you or your team been pulled away from a strategic initiative because of an ask from a business partner that you can't say no to? Or you found that despite executive agreement on marketing priorities, your team can't seem to connect their work to those priorities, and as a result, they don't know what to focus on. One CMO described trying to advance complex cross-functional initiatives at his organization as like trying to push a wet string. Just imagine that. Cross-functional collaboration as like pushing a cold, floppy, wet string across a table. Probably while other people at your organization are trying to push it back at you. This is not the tool that you want in your toolbox for responding to convergent disruption. Cross-functional work is plagued by the presence of a dynamic we call collaboration drag. I think this visual explains it well and incidentally goes to show that there's a graphic for absolutely everything these days. <laughs> you can think of collaboration drag as the weight that's slowing you down regardless of the direction that you're trying to run in. It comes in the form of too many meetings, too many processes, too many stakeholders, and too much feedback. Going back to our house analogy, you can think of this as the neighborhood group chat that should really help us solve local issues in our community, but instead gets railroaded by people arguing about politics. Even small amounts of drag have a huge impact. Collaboration drag makes organizations 37% less likely to achieve profit and growth goals, and it drives up both employee burnout and their intent to leave. Now, to me, this feels like a massive problem. And look, you might tell from my accent that I'm from England, where we're not generally known for being the most positive of people, but deep down, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So I think we should look at this the other way. I mean, think about it. Since collaboration drag is such a massive issue, even small shifts in how we operate can actually make a big difference, not just in giving us more control over our calendars, but to our wider organizations as well. So how do we fix this? How should the marketing function of tomorrow collaborate? The main thing to recognize is that more collaboration won't improve the outcome. Instead, the benefits come from being more selective. Now, given the painful stats that we've just shared, this maybe feels like a relief, even if you still have to deal with some of those mean people calling marketing a hindrance. <laughs> the key to being selective in the right way is to direct disruption in three areas. When, how, and what you'll contribute. Let's color that in a bit. The when. Most of us spend so many years trying to win a seat at the table that it becomes hard to say no to the invites. The real difference maker is having clear decision criteria for when you'll join in. Second, the how. This means setting guardrails for the scope of your participation so that once you are involved, everyone is clear on the kind of work that marketing will and won't do, as well as how work will be handed off. And then lastly, the what. Essentially, ensuring that whatever you do is rooted in your function's differentiated purpose and value. Here's just one example of how to tackle collaboration drag by staying focused on decision criteria, participation guardrails, and marketing impact. Brooks Running Shoes works through the same large-scale business strategy setting exercises that many of you do. They set ambitious company-wide goals, and functional leaders like the CMO are tasked with figuring out how exactly their organization, their teams will help the organization to achieve those goals. Increasingly, of course, it's not just one team that drives goal achievement. It's teams of teams globally and regionally. And those teams run, get it? <laughs> Into all the painful collaboration drag challenges we've just outlined. To improve cross-functional collaboration, Brooks made an operating change that may seem counterintuitive, but had huge impact on their ability to just get work done. They created more decision-making layers. In fact, they created an entire middle management layer for strategy. Brooks now has triads underneath the executive level that replicate the functional stakeholders at executive level. So if the three executives involved in setting the overall strategy 
were sales, product, and marketing. Now we have regional triads of sales, product, and marketing. And these triads are responsible for delivering business objectives like revenue goals. The triad structure helps to disperse decisions down to the middle management layer, meaning fewer meetings up at the top of the tree. There's always someone from each function at a decision-making table, but participation is limited, meaning that everyone in attendance knows each other's value add. By limiting the number of stakeholders, each person's voice is clearer, and it makes getting to a consensus much, much easier. Now, we're not saying that you need to build triads, so stop scribbling that down if you are. What you should take away from the Brooks example is the value of being selective and prescriptive on who is required to make decisions and who isn't across different levels of strategy and operations. So pick up your pens and write that down. Be more selective. As the complexity ramps up in our enterprises, the risk of collaboration drag will start adding up too. The solution is to let those three words become your guiding principle. Brooks's CMO, Melanie Allen, says their teams now have clarity around when they need to step up and where they need to step back. They're not involved in endless meetings, so they can focus on the limited number of things they are responsible for. And they've driven better progress on their go-to-market strategy as a result. This should be the goal for cross-functional collaboration in a marketing function designed to direct disruption because it allows us to take conditions of disruption and use those conditions as an incubator for marketing evolution. If cross-functional collaboration is a pain point for you and your teams, add these sessions to your agenda. And I, I see some cameras coming out here, so we'll give you all a moment to take photos if you want to, uh, but don't worry, these slides are also available on the conference's Navigator app, so you can view them after this session or you can share them with your teams. Has everyone taken note of which sessions interest you? Yes? Okay. Excellent. So that brings us to our final chapter in today's story of how to lead marketing through disruption's next wave. Chapter three, reasserting marketing's value to the enterprise. Remember our house metaphor? How could we forget? <laughs> well, this is where we check in that in our design enthusiasm, we haven't forgotten the things that make a house a house. No matter how modern, how eco-friendly, how community-connected that house is, it still needs things like windows, walls, floors. Similarly, the marketing function of tomorrow needs to stay anchored on value elements unique to marketing. These might not be new, in fact, they're not, but these kinds of essential marketing capabilities, in other words, your windows, walls, and floors, will be critically important in making the shift to directing disruption. We've already referenced how knowing your value add is a critical part of success in cross-functional work. So what is marketing functions value add? Well, let's see what you think about it. How about this? In your heads, just take a couple of seconds to think about how you would complete this sentence in one word. The marketing functions value add to the enterprise is? Does everyone have a word in mind? OK. so. Show of hands, who here said growth? Don't be shy, you're in good company. <laughs> in fact, Gartner has found that 79% of CMOs see themselves as the growth leader in their business. What if I were to tell you that only 38% of other C-suite executives view you the same way? In fact, when we ask other members of the C-suite to vote for someone, and even when we remove the option for them to vote for themselves, they were still more likely to say that the growth driver in their organization was the CEO or the CFO or the chief product officer or the chief commercial officer. The point is this. Yes, we're all focused on driving growth. But so is everybody else. It's like we want our house to be known for its natural light, but our neighbors have just as many, if not more, windows. We'll stand out more if we pick another feature, one that's more distinctive. So, when it comes to recasting the value proposition of marketing to the enterprise, we need to think about what marketing can uniquely own. In order to do that, there's one word you should all be thinking of when asked, what is marketing's value add to the organization? It's this, differentiation. You may still be growth focused, but your best method for impacting growth comes through classic marketing capabilities anchored in differentiation, especially when it comes to things your executive peers may not fully appreciate. Take that thing that we care about the most, 
the customer. While CEOs may rank growth as their main business priority, the customer ranks near the bottom. And that reveals an incredible opportunity to create value for the enterprise by helping to make the connection between customers, differentiation, and growth, i.e., by defining our differentiators in the customer's eyes and evidencing what that means for growth. The key is knowing exactly what it takes to drive differentiation in the eyes of your customer. And the bar's already being raised here, since we can see the top performing brands are pushing further ahead. Gartner benchmarks more than 1,000 of the world's biggest brands, and the best performers in digital marketing, which we term genius brands, are much more likely to hire data scientists into the marketing function than other brands. In fact, their job posts are 4.7 times more likely to contain data science keywords than their peers. Now, these brands are not just doing it to understand the customer for the sake of it. They're hiring that talent to decipher how their customers truly perceive them and what their customers' needs really are. Once they've cracked that, it makes them better able to positively impact customer journeys and drive ROI from the strategic investments that they make. The lesson here isn't to magic up extra headcount, but to learn from these brands' commitment to purposeful customer understanding. The question to ask yourself is, what do I need to understand about my customer to drive greater impact? If you keep on asking and answering that question, I promise you'll be in a much better position when a wave of disruption hits. In this new competitive context, marketing will have a huge role to play as stewards of the brand. Your customer understanding allows you to articulate from a brand perspective what makes you different, what makes you better, how you are intentionally evolving to improve your value. In times of rapid change, it's tempting, and your C-suite peers will be tempted to make rapid, reactionary changes to strategy, to customer engagement, to growth plans, to brand narratives, in an attempt to keep up with change. But as we've seen, continual adaptation is not the way to success. Instead, purposeful understanding will be your north star in a stormy sea the thing that you must use as a beacon to keep your organization on course. How? Well, leaders who are deliberate and steadfast in curating and maintaining their brand or intentionally evolving it as the business transforms are 37% more likely to achieve success than those who make reactionary change for the latest trend or threat. And they have a 75% success rate in performing against major targets, ROI of key brand activities, and performance against other senior leader expectations. I can add to that. Just a few weeks ago, I facilitated a panel featuring leaders from Maybelline and Fidelity, two genius brands from completely different sectors. And both of them described how the core of the brand strategy is set in stone, regardless of the channel, the, uh, the business unit, or the format that's being used. And that stance mirrors what we heard from several of the genius brands that we interviewed this year, all of which enjoy really high levels of brand awareness. So there is a correlation there, and the results are clear to see. Thanks to their strong brand awareness, these brands get a 10% higher share of their site traffic coming to them directly. That saves them on performance marketing investments since their customers are bypassing Google Ads and going straight to their domains. Now, that's convincing stuff, right? For me, all of these stats combined tell me what course we should all be taking. Rather than jostling for position in the list of growth leaders, we need to educate those other executives about the strengths and requirements of a brand strategy. That can drive growth in a way that your CFO or your CCO never will. And luckily, you'll have a secret weapon in that education process. If there's one thing that we can all agree CMOs do especially well, it's storytelling. And some might think of this as a soft skill, but it's one of those windows, walls, and floors elements that we can't disregard in times of fast-paced change, AI evolution, and cross-functional stuff. And differentiated storytelling, particularly around your brand narrative, is absolutely vital in times of disruption and transformation. Looking forward, 84% of companies of leaders say that their company's identity must completely or significantly change for them to achieve company objectives. And they say those transformative changes will need to happen in the next five years. Talk about convergent disruption. 
If your organization is on a transformational journey, then your role as the CMO is to tell the story of that transformation to your customers through brand narrative. Brand narratives help convey how a company's core identity is connected to its strategic direction. It helps customers see how the company is changing while still delivering the outcomes that they care most about. And this isn't just some fluffy, nice-to-have thing. A clear brand narrative has real commercial impact in times of change. In fact, when customers understand how and why a company is evolving, those companies are 1.4 times more likely to exceed their performance goals. Now, this should feel exciting because it clearly shows a potential irreplaceable role in driving growth that comes when we build on what we do best to direct perceptions, uh, direct disruption in our audience's perceptions. So the next time you're asked, what value does marketing provide to the enterprise? The answer is growth, yes. But specifically, it's marketing drives enterprise growth through the power of differentiation. Your vital, unusurpable contributions to growth are your ability to differentiate your company's brand and your ability to create differentiated customer experiences that connect customers to the things your brand does uniquely well. Like all of the topics that we've covered in this session, there's much more detail that you'll be able to get from the presentations across the conference. So if this is the topic for you, make sure to look out for these sessions on the agenda. At the start of today's session, we spoke about the three so-called evergreen truths of marketing. Ambitious goals, continual scrutiny, constant adaptation. You will still pursue ambitious goals. And you may indeed continue to labor under organizational scrutiny, as many functions will this year. But you will not achieve those goals or come through that scrutiny if you're merely adapting to continue to deliver the same forms of marketing value that you always have. Marketers need to design a new house. We are builders, after all. And if you have the right design, then we can build with intent. Here again are the three essential elements of the marketing function of the future. To direct disruption, take AI upheaval as an opportunity to reshape the tech and talent interdependencies. To direct disruption, be more selective in cross-functional collaboration with greater focus on defining marketing's value contributions. And finally, to direct disruption, emphasize marketing's unique capabilities of differentiation in brand value, brand narrative, and customer engagement. This quote may be familiar to some of you. Standing still is the fastest way of moving backwards in a rapidly changing world. If all you've been doing is adapting to continue to deliver, then all you've been doing is standing still. And if there is just one thing that we can inspire you to do this week, let it be this. The time is now to shift from adapting to deliver to directing disruption. It's been an honor to kick off this symposium with you all, and we invite you now to get out there, gather new inspiration, learn new strategies and tactics, and pick up the tools you'll need to build something fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you.